this is Dr. Joseph Awadis. Uh, Joe has probably made more beer than just about anybody else in the world. Uh, for my money, which is a lot, uh, I think he's the best brewmaster in the United States. He's certainly the most expensive, uh, and he may, may well be the best brewmaster in the world. Uh, he is, among other travesties, he is the father of light beer. Uh, he discovered and first utilized an enzyme called amylose glucosidase, without which we wouldn't have light beer today. And Joe has been a technical consultant for Boston Beer Company since the beginning, because there's nobody in the United States and probably the world that knows more about the technology and the science and the art as well of, of making beer. And he's going to talk for a minute about the magic of the brew kettle and the changes that take place in the work once they get into the brew kettle and they begin the actual brewing process uh, itself in the brew kettle. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. We're in the brew kettle now, and here we precipitate the proteins and some of the tannins in the barley bowl. We add hops. We extract from the hop bitter compounds which are isomerized in the kettle to give a fine bitter taste of beer. We also have volatile oils in hops, which are partly lost and partly oxidized and polymerized in the kettle to give beer its fine, delicate aroma and bouquet. We also sterilize the wort, and beer is the only beverage made with a sterile liquid. Neither wine nor whiskey starts with a sterile liquid, but in brewing we start with a sterile liquid. We're boiling here now for over an hour to precipitate the proteins and make all the reactions that are going to take place take place as well. The delicate operation, which we watch very carefully, the hops are added during different times of the boiling period to get the best flavor out of the different varieties of hops we use. This will go on for another hour and a half. Okay. So these bags have the hops in them. I'll show you what they look like. They come like this to the brewery in the form of these pellets. Now, when I have, when I buy hops, I buy them in Germany. And I have they're harvested once a year in October, but I use them all year long to brew with. Uh, and the problem the brewers have always had is keeping their hops as fresh as possible. What I do is, as soon as my hops are harvested, I take them and have them packed into pellets, compressed so that no air can get at them. And after they're pelletized, they're then put into these mylar bags. These bags will keep all the light out. Uh, we also suck the air out of the bag so that they're kept under a vacuum with no light reaching them and they're also kept at 32 degrees so that way you preserve the freshness of the hops for the whole year that you're brewing with them. And the hops are then put into the brew kettle. We'll show you that in just a second. Probably the most expensive hops you can buy. And they're added 
each one has added at its own special time during the brewing process to make sure that we get the right flavors out of each one. Not explain why. Okay, the idea of this tank, in the kettle now, you're boiling. You want to concentrate the work, you also want to get that conglomeration of those protein. You see those big clumps in the kettle. You see them sticking together? Okay, that's protein sticking there. The other thing you have is like residue from the hot. Now, in this hot work tank, it's built round and it's pumped in the side so that the centrifugal force can take over. And what it does is act like a centrifuge. And it gets all those solid particles that would precipitate out and it like spins them to the bottom of this tank. Okay, so that's why you see it swirling in this back here. So I'm running this through a work pool. Pull it from like a 212 degree boiling down to about 50 degrees there. Sit there and get yourself in. This is Mike Carada. He is the brewmaster here at Pittsburgh Brewing. He's in charge of making the beer. That means both getting it done every day, plus maintaining the quality, buying the ingredients, making any modifications uh, to improve the recipes, and making sure that the fat that comes out of here meets the standards and specifications. And he'll explain some of the things that happen to the beer after it gets out of the brew kettle that we saw and comes out of that brew kettle, goes into the hot work tank where it's centrifuged uh, around in order to settle out some of the harsher flavors and some of the protein and part of the hops that have accumulated during the brewing process. This is where the hops are stored.
types of sugars we'll call them fermentable and unfermentable. Now after the work is up in the fermenter, we take a sample of that and we measure initially the, the amount of those two sugars in here. Then the laboratory downstairs makes a quick fermentation in two days and they can tell me how much the dead solution is going to ferment out during uh, what period of time. Uh, what we do then on a daily basis is take a sample out of the fermenter and test how much fermentation has happened during that period of time. Then when our sample fermentation matches the lab fermentation, we know we're finished in this tank. We're able to pull it down, let the yeast settle to the bottom, and then withdraw what is now the beer. As another byproduct of fermentation, we have this system here to collect the CO2 that's giving off. Uh, we collect it as a gas, we're able to condense it into a liquid for storage, and then later on in the process, we re-vaporize it so we can inject it into our product right before it's packed. Yeah.